coming. Uh, I'll be speaking on Boko Haram's fatwa uh, on Nigeria, and this is more of uh, a research in progress report. Uh, it's, uh, it's a study uh, that, that uh, uh, started in the last uh, year or thereabout and recently uh, got uh, the Kilam Cornerstone Grant uh, from the University of Alberta. Uh, it, this is my second visit to Carlton, but my very first talk on this campus, well, and I'm uh, excited um, to be here. Now, um, Boko Haram's original objective uh, was to set up um, this puritanical version um, of the Sharia law in, in northern Nigeria, but its, its objective has since uh, evolved. Uh, and uh, precisely on the 24th of August 2014, Boko Haram declared uh, the formation of an Islamic state, uh, in line, I suppose, with uh, the trend in the world, the rise of ISIS, uh, and of course, the, uh, the relatively free reign that, that it's been able to, to operate in northern Nigeria. Uh, and a key part of uh, Boko Haram's ascendance is uh, the deployment of federal troops and uh, its attendant allegations of extrajudicial killings, uh, crimes against humanity, and, and so forth. Now, it's, it's interesting looking at the rise of Boko Haram uh, and, and sort of cross-examining it in, li in line with uh, established colony literature. Uh, one of the key things here uh, would be the, the fact that the killing insurgent leaders is in fact uh, counterproductive if, 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 if you're trying to put an end to insurgencies. Uh, there's a fantastic piece in Defense Studies uh, by Keith Deere, 20, uh, 2013, which looks at uh, American uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis British foreign policy and found that while well, the U.S. would typically uh, take out all or neutralize all insurgent leaders and so forth, the British would uh, generally adopt a much more careful approach and uh, not wipe off the entire uh, leadership of uh, insurgency and thereby have folks to be able to negotiate with. Uh, and we'll talk more, I believe, about this uh, during the Q&A. So it, it does appear that killing insurgent leaders is counterproductive. And uh, the uh, assassination of Muhammad Yusuf, the leader of Boko Haram in 2009, by the police uh, uh, has contributed to the indiscriminate violence that we now see uh, with respect to Boko Haram. Uh, and I'll just give you, you know, a little bit of background in terms of uh, what is going on and what, what we now know about Boko Haram. Um, there, there's been several studies that, that have looked at the, the rise of Boko Haram, the, the role that social, <coughs> political, economic, and cultural factors have played, uh, Boko Haram's relationship with the uh, global uh, system, particularly its link with global jihadi networks such as Al-Qaeda, and of course its increasing association with, with ISIS. Um, the challenges that Boko Haram poses for the war on terror, uh, and its, its ties to uh, local fundamentalist groups such as uh, Mitchell Sinek, which goes as far back as the 1980s. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, the relationship of, of, of this particular group uh, with the, it's, it, the political context, the structure of the Nigerian society, the, this whole notion of failed or failing states or weak states and associated concepts. Uh, and what the implications might be for democratic governance and national integration efforts in Nigeria. And next I would like to just show just a few slides in terms of the, the attacks, the targets and the tactics and the kinds of weaponry that, that this organization uses. Uh, now this, this, this is something I found on the BBC website just uh, a couple of days ago and, and it comes from uh, uh, the global terrorism database. So at the moment, as you can see, in terms of uh, fatalities from uh, terror attacks uh, from 2004 to 2013, uh, Nigeria now ranks number five, just behind Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, and India. So it, it, it's that, that uh, climb of this, this list of uh, victims of attack is uh, something that is obviously quite troublesome. Uh, but, but these are from my, my study, again, my, my analysis of um, the Global Terrorism Database, which is housed at the University of Maryland and is a, an open access resource. There are other databases, such as that of the Rand Corporation and so forth, that require some kind of uh, subscription. Uh, and so, um, as of 2013, Nigeria was responsible, and specifically Boko Haram was responsible for 3% uh, of the uh, global share. Of, of terrorist uh, attacks, 3%. Uh, 
Uh, and, and this obviously keeps growing, particularly if we consider that 2014 was particularly brutal when the Vaga uh, issue in which uh, uh, 2,000 people believed to have died uh, has not obviously been put into, uh, into that uh, uh, calculation. Um, so terrorism in Nigeria is now growing at a faster rate than Iraq. Uh, the terrorism in Iraq and, and, and Pakistan. These are the two leading countries when we talk about global terrorism. At the moment, Nigeria is on par with Afghanistan, uh, not in terms of the absolute numbers, but in terms of the rate uh, at which terrorism uh, is moving. If you look at the chart here, chart number uh, number two, you can see that uh, between 2012 and 2013, for instance, there was a 252% rise in the rate of terrorist attacks in Nigeria, and that, that seems uh, to be the, the trend. Um, now, uh, approximately 70% of uh, uh, terror attacks in Nigeria uh, can be attributed to Boko Haram. So it, it, it has become, for all intents and purposes, the main terrorist group in Nigeria, uh, which is fascinating if we look back uh, 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 pre-2009 uh, when uh, a group such as the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta was uh, the main insurgent group, which at the time was the clearinghouse of the uh, oil conflict in the Delta region of Nigeria, but uh, Boko Haram has since uh, taken over uh, that spot. Um, and in terms of uh, the total number of attacks, uh, as of 2013, a total of 803 attacks uh, uh, were attributed uh, to Boko Haram. Now, uh, and if I may speak to charts number six there, and that is the fact that uh, only about 17% of the attacks that are in fact attributed to Boko Haram are in fact claimed by Boko Haram. Um, it claims only 17% in terms of its discursive framing. It claims only 17% of the attacks that are attributed to. Now, these are implications in terms of how the Nigerian government moves forward in terms of solving this problem. Uh, a, is Boko Haram responsible for all of these attacks? And B, has Boko Haram essentially become a franchise for terrorist attacks in the country? So these are questions I believe that moving forward would, would have to be answered. Uh, the bulk of Boko Haram's attacks, 93% uh, of its attacks are directed at non-combatants, unarmed individuals, unarmed civilians. It's only in 7% 7, 7 of the cases that that actually focuses on individuals who are in, in, in uh, uh, obvious violation of international law. Now, and this just shows just the, the spread of, of its attacks. Um, uh, uh is number one at 31 percent, Kano at nine percent, Francisco Mdamatu, and so forth. Uh, and of course, Abuja, the federal capital territory, uh, has uh, experienced one percent of, of, atta of attacks by uh, Boko Haram. Now, in terms of its, uh, its targets, its tactics and weapons, uh, so the police, 23% uh, of, of those attacks. Private citizens come next with 19%. Uh, government buildings and offices of personnel, 11%. Uh, religious figures, military, and so forth uh, come next. Uh, hijacking is its favorite mode, so hijacking uh, uh, bosses and, and, and so forth. Uh, kidnapping has also uh, grown uh, increasingly uh, sophisticated in the last few months. Uh, armed assault is also quite prominent in its attacks. Um, in terms of the weapons that Boko Haram uses, now a lot has been said and, and written about its use of uh, IEDs and bombs and car bombs and so forth. Uh, but as, as you can see on the screen, uh, uh, firearms are in fact its main weapons, 49% of the time. And so in terms of tackling uh, the Boko Haram menace, it's important to look at the flow of these arms and ammunition. Where is Boko Haram getting its, its weapons uh, from? So this this would be critical in terms of how uh, we tackle this issue. Um, and one other point I'll make uh, right on this slide is the fact that um, on average, Boko Haram, each Boko Haram attack uh, kills five individuals. So five persons die per attack of Boko Haram. Uh, now, why a single loss of life is in fact significant, but in terms of uh, what we see in terms of the trends around the world, this would appear quite crude and unsophisticated, which suggests that if, if the country moves really quickly, uh, the, the, the chances are that an end may be put to it, because 
uh, as, as long as it, it continues to have free range, that number can only grow. So at the moment, it is grossly inefficient, crude, and unsophisticated, okay? which, which still offers a sort of window of opportunity to be able to take care uh, of this growth. Now, now, a lot has been said, a lot has been written in, in terms of uh, this group, but there are certain discernible gaps in the literature, and this is where my study comp comes in. This is uh, what I hope would be a book length uh, project. Um, in, the, the dynamics and intricacies of the Nigerian military, particularly the Nigerian army, and how that uh, uh, influenced uh, the ascendance of Boko Haram has yet to be examined in, in the literature. And of course, the fundamentally gendered nature of this insurgency. Now, prior to April 14, 2014, for instance, Boko Haram would typically go into schools, uh, kill all the boys, and basically tell the girls to go home and get married. Uh, but that changed uh, on April 14th of last year when those school girls in Chibok uh, were, were kidnapped. And so why did that happen? Why April 14, 2014? Why Chibok? These are questions that need to be asked. Uh, and part of the concern of my, uh, my study uh, it's, it's, it's how, in fact, uh, Boko Haram seems to latch on um, to the patriarchal, ideational infrastructure of the Nigerian society and the way that the society treats women. Uh, they, they, a very uh, a well publicized case a few days ago was a 10 year old girl uh, who claimed that her father had, in fact, sold her uh, to, to Boko Haram, but somehow she managed. Uh, to, to escape. Now, uh, there have been several incidents of young girls who uh, had bombs strapped upon them and detonated remotely. Uh, so th th these are critical issues that my study hopes to examine. But also what would appear to be the evolving nature of public support uh, for, for Boko Haram. Uh, it started off as this group uh, clamoring for <coughs> Islam, implementation of true Sharia, and, and so forth. Uh, and how has that changed? Uh, and how do we map the trajectory of this change? How, how, has, how has that evolved, uh, particularly uh, amongst the Muslim or Ummah in, in northern Nigeria? These, these are things that I am interested in. Um, but also, there, there hasn't been anything done so far in terms of looking at uh, uh, the, the ideational infrastructure of, of, of its framing strategies. How does Boko Haram frame its, 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 its activities? And how has the Nigerian government sought to frame Boko Haram. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with this particular uh, strand of literature, in social movement scholarship, there's the political process paradigm, uh, which essentially looks at structures and opportunities and, uh, and, and wider systemic issues in society in terms of analysis of how social movements evolve and how they accomplish their goals. Uh, but over time, a new uh, and different strand grew, which, which is that uh, this, the, the framing as, as this uh, a response to the uh, structuralist bias and uh, supposed negation of human agency in, so, uh, in social movement scholarship, which essentially takes into cognizance uh, how movement actors, individuals, uh, play critical roles in, in groups, and how language and meaning construction uh, and interpolation uh, in an Althusserian sense of the masses can play a role in how we understand how a group performs. Uh, it's also clear that a lot of the studies that are out there are largely based on secondary sources. I, I am yet to come across any, any work that, that's based on uh, primary data. This, this is what I, I uh, these are things I'm interested in. Um, now, so the overarching question that, that my study seeks to examine is, is uh, the, the sociogenesis of etiology of the Boko Haram phenomenon. Uh, and intricacies of the military setup, as I mentioned earlier, the gender that mentions uh, the opinions of select members of, of communities, of northern communities, the Muslim Omar to, Omar to be precise, about Aboko Arms activities, its framing strategies, and the implications of the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls uh, campaign. Uh, in terms of uh, data and methods, this is a multi site transnational study involving uh, uh, countries like Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger. And, and chart with various locations, as you can see on the screen. Um, this would involve in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with eight sets of actors, uh, including some of the uh, uh, girls who were able to escape from um, Boko Haram's uh, stronghold. Uh, some of them are now live in the United States, others are scattered all over uh, Nigeria. And of course, uh, military personnel uh, and, and their take on, on 
the constraints that they face in their battle uh, against Boko Haram, journalists who have covered these incidents, political leaders, particularly in the Northeast uh, part of Nigeria, human rights activists who are engaged in this uh, struggle and traditional rulers, and uh, Boko Haram members as well. I did uh, come across a young man at the University of Abuja last year who had completed his PhD on Boko Haram, and he showed me videos on his phone. Uh, where he was interviewing uh, Boko Haram members. So they, they, they are, they're everywhere in the country. Uh, it, it, and I, if my experience in writing my book on kidnapping the Delta is anything to go by, uh, it, it, it is in fact uh, doable in terms of being able to, to interview them and get a sense of their life or why they're doing uh, what they do. So those, those are some of the things that, are, uh, that will be done. Um, and of course, uh, various databases, as I said earlier, some of the open access sources, others are not. Uh, there are reports that are, are trickling in from, from the government uh, our committee on the abduction of uh, the Chibok uh, uh, school girls, uh, and of course, uh, movement organizations that have been explicitly involved in, uh, the, uh, in the move to free these girls. Uh, we're, we're in, in the next few days, we'll be hosting uh, of Yagali as a Kwesili, uh, a name many of you may uh, be familiar with, uh, Nigeria's former Minister of Education, she has been very well engaged in, in, this, in this movement. Um, and of course, reports of NGOs, Human Rights Watch, Chatham House, Atlantic Council, Africa Center, and so forth. Um, and of course, the Nigerian military, uh, specifically the, uh, the uh, defense headquarters, runs a blog in, in which they, they post that. Uh, uh, their, their official response to things in the media uh, and their reactions to uh, claims by the other side, i.e. Boko Haram, and of course every now and then they, uh, they uh, try to refute certain uh, things that are reported uh, globally. So this is also a very useful resource, uh, and, 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 and so forth. Uh, now, the, the other aspect of my talk today is about how we in fact understand um, this insurgent violence. Now, the scholarly literature is replete with all kinds of uh, uh, perspectives in, in terms of violence on the African continent. Uh, some of you may be familiar with, with the apocalyptic view uh, that's uh, embedded and perhaps specified it, uh, by the uh, Kaplan's book, uh, The Coming Anarchy, which presents this uh, doomsday scenario of, of the continent. Uh, and the culturalist perspective, which ostensibly uh, pathologizes the uh, African cultures uh, and, and describes uh, various outbursts of cycles of violence as purely irrational. Uh, and of course, neo patrimonial explanations that prove this attempt to rehumanize uh, uh, Africans and uh, cycles of violence on the continent and tries to provide various uh, situational uh, ex explanations for why these things happen. Uh, and of course, uh, this peculiarly homo economicus perspective spearheaded by World Bank economist Nicole uh, in the idea that rebellion or violence is in fact um, just another economic activity. People engage in violence because of things, because uh, they, they, they stand to gain certain things for it. Um, but I find in Kandu uh, uh perspective on these three kinds of rebel movements particularly uh, instructive. It, 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 uh, uh, especially this notion of secessionist slash regionalist movements and, and why and how they evolve, uh, 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 especially from the ethnic conflicts and intra elite squabbles and so forth. Uh, that would seem to be a play in northern Nigeria with elites uh, patronizing uh, uh, the late uh, founder of, of Boko Haram, and trying to secure votes and so forth, and promising that in return they would institute a pure form of Sharia, and, but never lived up to those promises, uh, and, and, and so forth. Now, the last thing I'll address before <coughs> taking my seat, and I would uh, have my co-panelists uh, uh, speak, would be the, uh, the ongoing uh, uh, controversy over uh, media coverage or non-coverage of the violence perpetrated by Boko Haram uh, in northern Nigeria. Uh, and and the, the coverage, on the other hand, afforded uh, to victims of the terrorist attacks uh, in, in France. Uh, first and perhaps most obvious is that this is a function of a weakness of the Nigerian state. Uh, the world paid attention to the French attacks because of the relative strength of the French state uh, and, and the fact that they were able to act decisively uh, and they, they were able to deploy the, the various uh, uh, 
apparatus of surveillance and architectures of, of security to apprehend the suspects really, uh, or at least get them neutralized really quickly and pick up other suspects that were directly or indirectly involved uh, in, in what happened. Uh, another obvious factor would be that the containment of Boko Haram's atrocities within the sub-Saharan region. So at the moment, uh, it, it doesn't really seem to bother anyone outside that region very much. Uh, uh, a retired general uh, in the United States um, uh, was on CNN a few days back and talked about how it was not a priority. Uh, Boko Haram was not a priority, that if it had been a priority, it would have been dealt with um, by now. Um, but I also argue in, in an article that came up just a week ago uh, on uh, uh, Premium Times, uh, which is a Nigeria-focused uh, news website, um, that this is, this is essentially about the media's need to present an essentialized dichotomy between the forces of good and evil. Uh, in the Nigerian case, that dichotomy is not clear cut. Uh, there are really no good guys, there are only bad guys and less bad guys. Uh, and so, how do you pick sides? Because the military uh, uh, often go in uh, and also perpetrate atrocities against the people. So, on whose side are you? How do you frame what is going on in terms of um, the, 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 the chaos there? Um, but also, the, the reality on the ground is that the frequency of Boko Haram attacks um, has, has reduced its level of extraordinariness and by implication, the news value of what is going on, in spite of the horror and shock and the horrors of those killings. Uh, if, if France would experience the same uh, rate of violence on a daily basis or, or every other day over the next one, two, or three years, it will become still news as well, and the world may no longer pay uh, attention to it. Um, now, but there's also the, the role played by colonial mentality. Uh, and, and as I argue in that article, this is a tragedy of formerly colonized people's desire, mimicry, and this fetishistic focus on what former colonizer capitals are doing, such that uh, the reality is that the killings in Baga did not uh, attract as much media attention as you would expect in Nigeria and across the African continent. Um, and this is not just uh, a problem on the continent itself, but also uh, as far back as the uh, 19th century, uh, an Australian writer was complaining about how um, Australians would not take his scholarly work, or literary work, seriously until he was being celebrated in England. And the moment his work becomes accepted uh, in the British press, then he becomes, uh, uh, you know, someone conferred with legitimacy and hence worthy of being noticed in Australian media. So it's just how these things play out, and I believe this colonial mentality or cultural cringe as the Australians would like to call it, has, has, has also played a role in what we find. But also, of course, the global media hegemony. Um, the, the, the media is heavily concentrated in a certain part of the world, and that necessitates that uh, priorities would have to be made in terms of what makes the news, what is considered newsworthy, what the audience is interested uh, in, in, in seeing. Um, now, closely tied to that is, is, is what the media circles is known as a cultural feeling rules. Um, and then this is a case of gradation of human lives, essentially. Um, and I think a, a Canadian case uh, in, indicates what, what, uh, the way that this plays out. Uh, some of you may recall the death of Robert Zikansky on the floor of the Vancouver airport uh, in 2007. This was a national tragedy uh, and a watershed moment in terms of the use of force, particularly electromagnetic destruction technologies by the police in Canada. Now, it was fascinating, and two colleagues and I wrote a, uh, a paper on this, which came out in the journal Social Identities. Um, we, we sort of looked at the previous casualties um, in the hands of the police in, in terms of the use of these devices, and specifically the taser, uh, and why and how the Zikansky incident generated that much controversy and attention, uh, such that others just could not, uh, you know, really garner any significant coverage in, in Canadian society. Uh, and part of it was that the Zakansky incident did have a digital identity, so that you could go on YouTube and play and replay the life of this individual who was alive this minute and the next minute is on the floor. Yeah, that, that was a major part of it. 
But another part of it was that he was an individual from a country that mainstream Canadian society could associate with. This was a Polish immigrant, a 40-year-old who was coming to, uh, to meet his mom and, uh, and at least in theory establish a new life for himself. But the bulk of those who had been tasered to death earlier were individuals of Aboriginal background who were interestingly blamed for their, uh, for their death, for being casualties in the hands of the police. So they were, even in death, uh, denied victimhood status. So the fact that a tragedy happens does, does not mean that people did, uh, generally associate with what has happened or that they have uh, any, any feelings uh, uh, towards uh, the victim or that the victim is in fact seen as an authentic victim. So these, these are the realities uh, in which uh, uh, we live. Um, and so in that article I go on to argue about why it is in fact important that Boko Haram incidents make global news. And I know this is fairly uh, contentious a point uh, to make. Uh, but, but, I, but I predicate that argument on, on the fact that uh, if we're dealing with cancer, or we're dealing with <coughs> HIV AIDS, awareness certainly helps. Uh, because through awareness, you hope that people uh, would uh, change their ways, uh, eating habits uh, and, and behaviors, and, and so forth. But when the, the problem at hand is an armed insurgency in which people are dying on a daily basis, awareness in and of itself is insufficient a mechanism for tackling. You need concise action. Awareness is, is almost useless at that, at that point. This was not an insurgency that was brewing. This was an insurgency that was already very much in motion. Awareness was not what was needed. What was needed was for the Nigerian people and the government of Nigeria to act decisively. And on that note, I would like to thank you for this. Thank you.
which needs to be separated from the absence mm -hmm. of a political will. And then there is the absence of a regional or a sub-regional will, so to speak. What do I mean by the absence of a, of a national will uh, to engage Boko Haram fundamentally? That goes into the very question of Nigerian nationhood and the underlying identities, or identity, the structures of feeling, you know, which unite or do not unite, you know, uh, the people. The in October or November, if these attacks are so frequent now, you don't even know which ones to to recall as you saw from the data. In Nigeria, in October, or November of last year, I was in. As I got off the plane in Nigeria, attacks had just happened in the usual flashpoints between uh, Yobe and so was Yobe and Bokolo states. You know, and figures were flying around, you know, 50 people blown up, 60 people, 70, 100, and all the conflicting figures were flying around. I got off the plane in Nigeria because I left Canada, went for a series of lectures. But well, how did I get to hear about these attacks? Did I hear it from people at the airport in Lagos? Or when I got to town in Lagos, when I got to, you know, when I started moving around Lagos, did I get a sense of a national tragedy that had just blown, you know, literally just blown up hundreds of compatriots? You know, you know, you would have thought that I was still in Ottawa or I was in London or I was anywhere in Ibadan. So whose problem is Boko Haram? Who owns that problem? If you're traveling in what we loosely call Southern Nigeria, and that's a gross simplification, but you know, for the purposes of understanding Southern Nigeria. If you travel in those spaces in, in, in that part of the country, yeah, there is there is Boko Haram, but to a great extent, mentally, it is still their problem up there. I got to hear about that problem because I'm a social media person. I'm a social media person, so things were flying because Nigerians in the diaspora. We're discussing it and oh my god, this just happened, blah blah blah. And I started responding to people, hey guy, I'm in Lagos, there is no sense of this. You I have to go to CNN or BBC to even come to an assessment of the seriousness of what has just happened up north. So is there a pan-Nigerian structure of film? of ownership of that problem, of this crisis, in a fundamental sense? That's a question. That's a, that's, that's, that's a question. And what, how do we account for that? In the 90s, when it was the turn of the Niger Delta, and, 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 and no, make, make that 80s, 90s, you know, when, when the military started leveling villages, starting with Umweche in 1992. Uh, you know, you Babangida know, leveled a couple of villages. You, know, you just have somebody in, in Abuja who would order the Nigerian Air Force. In fact, the only, the only times the Nigerian Air Force uh, has ever been active in terms of bombardment anywhere is when they have been ordered to bomb and wipe out and level out Nigerian villages, starting with Umwech and uh, Age, and then Obasanjo added uh, Odi and um, Zakitian and all that, you know. And then the insurgency, the, the militancy in the United Delta. While all that was happening, uh, I traveled in the north a lot, Kaduna, Kanu, Subutu, and all that. It's their problem. That's their problem. Down there. So you've got no sense of this national tragedy. You know, no sense, no pan-Nigerian sense 
of a collectively shared trauma. Why is that? Because if you cannot build a national will around the phenomenon that is Boko Haram, quite frankly, sometimes when you travel and, and you address Nigerian communities in the past, Northerners tend to plug into narratives of Boko Haram from the perspective of the embarrassment in terms of the way that the narrative collectively defines us. If it wasn't, in most cases, it was, you know, in the last two years, the press Nigerians in Europe, here in North America, and all. So, what are the impediments to the emergence of the sort of pan Nigerian or trans Nigerian national will that would be a fundamental precondition for tackling the problem of this marriage? It all goes back to the errors of the rendering. And our chief speaker alluded to it. The fundamental faults, problems of the emergence of that nation. Let me let me because I'm I'm currently doing a graduate seminar on African life writing. And we are studying what is showing in Kenya. We're treating his memoirs. And this week, we focused on his account of the emergence of what he calls, he never says the Nigerian nation in his writings. He never alludes to the nation. He calls it a nation space. And you will see all kinds of caveats, all kinds of adjectives, you know, in quick nation space, you know, uh, problematic nation space. And a, a contemporary of it, you know, arguably Nigeria's most famous poet, you know, also referred to, you know, we'll say the errors of the rendering, the errors of the rendering. Like, what does he mean by the errors of the rendering? You know, this, 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 this inability to forge that collective national will. We'll see how he accounts for it. And Boko Haram cannot be taken out of that foundational moment. You know, we like to situate it in the present, but things, things went wrong a long time ago, you know, from the very beginning. And so you cannot, um, recent memoirs, so this will explain why Boko Haram is their problem, why militancy was their problem, and you know, everything in between. Recent memoirs by former colonial officers have revealed how crooked the beginning was. He's talking about the beginning of Nigeria. The elections that placed the government in power at the center were rigged by the British. John Bull was not about to leave an independent Nigeria under the control of any uppity radicals as the southern nationalists in the east and the west were perceived. Thus, on instructions from the British Home Office, even the Nigerian census was falsified, giving an artificial majority to the North, which was largely feudalist by tradition and conservative in political outlook. The census was actually based on sample <coughs> head counts, random or selective, no one knew, which were then roughly multiplied by the acreage of the landmass, irrespective of actual population density. In its resolve to ensure that the nation was handed over to a conservative power, the British did not rely on numerical strength alone. After all, the North did harbor radical or rebellious elements, such as thieves in what was known as the Middle Belt, or the Northern Elements Progressive Union, in quite sizable numbers. And so, to make absolutely certain that power did not fall into the wrong hands, specific instructions were issued by the British Home Office to its civil servants. The final results of elections to the federal legislature must be manipulated where necessary 
in favor of the political conservatives. High volume material, now free of the, of the time constraints of the official secrets acts, testify to this. An admission and even a statement of regret was wrung out of a serving British minister during the Abache years. The president had, however, been set, and Regan now answered the name of democracy. Not surprisingly, the national flag began to unravel rather quickly after independence. And he puts a footnote here. In 1992, the memoirs of a former colonial, uh, colonial officer, Harold Smith, were ready for publication, but suppressed by the British government. The author sent me the manuscript. So that's that's what the British government didn't know. They had sent the manuscript to show him down for in which he revealed that he had been ordered by the home office by the home office to take part in the rigging of the 1959 elections. In his own words, it was the British who taught Nigerians the art of rigging. What the British rigged was much more than the election. It was much more than elections. So that's why today, actually, when we conduct elections, you know, I'm very unsympathetic to the idea of the British media talking about democracy in Nigeria and all that because you know, they created, don't talk about rigged elections in Nigeria because you, know, you started it. But what they started was also a nation where ethnic animosities, regional animosities, and all these fault lines that they coupled together and rigged and created fault lines, you know, were going to be exacerbated by the people they put in place. And that led us to a civil war. A civil war in which about two million people were massacred. And outside of that civil war, cycles of genocide against the Igbos were You had not exercised that. You have not dealt with that because there is no national will to even deal with Biafra or to accept Biafra and all the other tragedies we have had. Boko Haram is part of that continuum. If Biafra was their problem, and militants in the Niger Delta was their problem, Boko Haram, I'm afraid, in the context of this fault lines, that are still not addressed. So the police, the lack of which southern president, especially from the middle, middle, from the south, sir, is going to master the political way of doing the change. You will never move beyond, because again, the structures are failing. This foundation is there. You will never move beyond lip service and maybe appearances. But deep down, these problems have never really been addressed. Added to that, the regional dimensions and the sub regional dimensions of, of, of the problem. Because from Nigeria, they make all these forays. It's become a huge problem now for Chad. It's become a huge problem for Cameroon and all that. And people always wonder beyond the the first time, the first time that the three affected presidents met on this question was when was the meeting in Paris last year, which actually got good Lord Jonathan in some kind of ideological trouble. You know, why would, why would Paris summon an Anglophone African and you, and you went? So the Anglophone Francophone thing is very deep. The Anglophone Francophone divide, uh, if you look too closely into it, you know, it's, a, it's a regime of mutual suspicion and mutual, mutual contempt. You know, the moment you cross, the moment you cross, the, you know, the picture, the picture of President Yai Boni of, uh, of Benin Republic. 
going to weep over 12 dead French dead journalists, you know, that, that, that went viral, at least in African social media spaces. There he was at the march in Paris, weeping, profusely. But he had flown out of Kotobu that same day, about 2,000 of his fellow West Africans had been blown up. He had nothing to say about it. So he hasn't said anything about that. But the moment you start thinking, oh, I'll grumble about Yayibone, well, good luck, Jonathan also didn't say anything about, about it. But then, how is Nigeria going to find common purpose with Cameroon and Chad? Those are Francophones. Those are Francophones. And you have some kind of Anglophonic provincialist sense of superiority looking down those Francophones who never cut the umbilical cord from France. <laughs> you cross the border from Nigeria, from Nigeria to Benin Republic and Togo. Yeah, you're looking down. And then when you cross a flower to Ghana, ha! Now you're back in, you're back in business. <laughs> and the contempt is returned by the Francophones. So you have each behaving like the other doesn't really exist. You know, those, are, those are real issues. Those are real, those are, those are real. Those are very, very real issues. And I'm sure maybe Luca will have something. The power of popular culture, of narratives and all that, and how they shape politics and the consequences they have. You know, how Nigeria is viewed in the bare palos, in the bare palos of, of, of Francophone Africa. How Francophone Africa is viewed and narrated in the bare palos of Nigeria and, and, and Ghana. And so that's why if people are looking from the outside who don't understand the significance of these things, why can't these three presidents go? It took a European to get them together to talk. And they are facing the same problem. And after they left Paris, each has been Idris Deby now is talking of um, Idris Deby now is speaking of invading Baga to uh, to drive away Boko Haram and re to recapture Baga. So no, the Baga is in Nigeria. He's going to come from Chad. Idris Deby is the president of Chad. He's going to come in from Chad. And wipe away Boko Haram without needing to talk to his Anglophone counterpart in Abuja. That is, how he, that is how he works. And if you want to know how serious these issues of, of perception, and I'll stop there, of, of perception, are, you know, the Francophone Anglophone. Thing. I can speak to that because I have I have a leg each in both um, <laughs> in both um, worlds, the, the, the Francophone and the Anglophone worlds uh, in, in, in Africa. Uh, an Anglophone president would not take his counterparts seriously in Africa, in Francophone Africa, because he is part of the ways of seeing generated by one significant moment in 2002. In 2002, the World Cup in Korea, Korea, Japan, the football. You still remember that? The World Cup, in, the FIFA World Cup in Korea, Japan, yeah. Do you remember that opening match? The opening match, 2002 was between Senegal and France. And so, you know, that got attention. A former colonial master versus a former colonialist and all that, all what's going to happen and all that. And don't forget that the French team in 2002 was still largely composed of the team that had won in 98 and, and, and had won the, the the Europe in 2000. So you still had the Henri's, you still had, you know, that generation, the Zidane's, even though he was in Jordan. So, of course, it, this is going to be a walkover for France. 
would be a local gun and all that. And you want to be who? Saying I got one. One zero. And then in the media booth, <laughs> after after the score of that goal, that Senegal display, the media was all over him. And so what are your sentiments? How do you feel? Not only did you score the opening goal of the World Cup, but then, wow, Senegal defeated France. And I said, ah, yeah, yeah, I'm so glad. Let me start by saying that I dedicate this goal to the glory of France and Senegal. <laughs> <laughs> that is how the Anglophone, the Nigerian, the Ghanaian, sees the Cameroonian, the Chadian, the, the sub serbian people who can break away from France. Why would good Lord Jonathan go and deal with Idris Baby and Paul Bia on the same table? So those issues are very real. Boko Haram or no Boko Haram, there is no regional sense of things. So those two absences, the absence of a national will and the absence of a regional will, you know, combine to complicate or aggravate or exacerbate the absence of a political will. So I think all three absences should be taken together uh, when we think about Boko Haram and not only focus on the absence of the political will on the part of the political players in Nigeria. Thank you. Okay, so this is what happens when you have two very passionate speakers <laughs> um, about their country um, and all these issues and uh, speaking. So what I plan to do is um, play the role of our timekeeper as much as possible, seeing that we have, um, I think, um, we have less than 30 minutes. So that um, we stop at one, I think, officially. And I just want to bring a different angle and see how I can tie up this and um, create room for conversation because I'm sure that so many people uh, would want to um, join the conversation. Thank you so much for the, the preamble. You make my job very easy. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do is there has been talk about Boko Haram, um, our friend and colleague. Dr. Ella has um, laid out, you know, from a very sociological point of view, um, some of the intricacies of Boko Haram. And uh, Dr. Desomi has brought in um, some humanities angle to it and then bringing in um, the advantage of his two legged scholarship as well, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, being French and um, English, uh, which is part of the problem. Of the Boko Haram insurgency in that tiny, not tiny, let's say tiny, we're talking about an area that is about the size of Belgium. So, very often, the Boko Haram uh, discourses tend to overlook the complexity of the problem. And so, um, issues of corruption, of the inefficacy of the Nigerian military, and so many of these negative um, images of the continent play up as part of the reason why Boko Haram has not been contained. Um, those two play the part, but there's more to it. What is Boko Haram? Who is Boko Haram's leader? What does he represent? So if you give me just a few seconds, I'm gonna play a video clip. Um, in the age of YouTube, and um, the kind of social media apartheid that Boko Haram, ISIL, and um, different kinds of organizations are deploying popular culture to their advantage and to our disadvantage. Uh, it looks very inevitable that I should bring in this lunatic, you know, that is spearheading Boko Haram. So that, and I would <coughs> like to this clip, I'm gonna give you like a few seconds to digest it and to see what you think about this character. Now, 
look at the stats I have done. Boko Haram leader, kill, kill. And I can just fill up that space with kill, kill, kill. <laughs> Certain of it, um, I think, it will be faster. Mm -hmm. So that I can streamline it. So that saves our time. <laughs> yeah, we can't do it with this, you know? That makes it come out. That means that, all right, cool. <laughs> because it gives you a sense of the psychology of the individual that leads this organization. And then the questions I want to leave is, what does it represent? What is Boko Haram's mission? How does that key into the theorizing by my friends? And how all the ideas that they bring up about the reluctance um, to forge unity, a national force, you know, to crack down Boko Haram. And I like, uh, just before I play this, too, for us to remind ourselves that Nigeria led ECOMOG and crushed many of the insurgencies and rebellions in different parts of the well as um, in West Africa. And Nigerian peacekeeping, Nigerian military is highly respected in the continent. Our United Nations have had to depend on them for peacekeeping. Nigeria went through a war of three, went three years with Biafra and managed to put together and crush Biafra. Uh, with the genocide that was committed. In the 21st century, with a more sophisticated military, um, despite the acts of corruption, we must begin to think why that political will seems to be missing in dealing with Boko Haram. So let's, let's, let's meet this guy. In every region, now has reason to get Either you are with but I mean, we are Muslim, who are following, better put them, or you are with the Obama, or the other, just put, put, kill him first. I forgot what Abraham did for. struggling with some of these devices and having a playbook of 
ISIL to work with. And these videos are coming out. How are these being deployed? Shekaro has created, he, he keeps metamorphosing. Um, I don't know how many of you know how many times this guy has died. That the Nigerian military actually released. He has become something of a sphinx. And, you know, his character is still being studied. So you're not even sure whether there is some kind of impersonation or there is something of a model. In dealing with a character as uh, Shekharo, the Nigerian military has found it very difficult because having to crush this also requires community policy. A very interesting rumor was published in Nigerian newspapers this week where some priests in Ogun State, um, the citizens tipped off the police that there are some Boko Haram insurgents in the community. Uh, note that Boko Haram is restricted to the southeast, I'm um, sorry, not eastern part of the country. And the police turned the place only to describe that they were Catholic priests. So what creates the situation that allows Boko Haram to operate a Scotch F policy? I has um, raised a number of questions and um, I raised these questions. I'd like us to know the fact that the problem of Boko Haram hasn't quite been properly articulated and it's just about the to happen. Because only um, in, on June 16, 2011, that was the first suicide bombing in Nigeria. Nigerians thought that it could never be suicide bombing in Nigeria. And there's a joke in Nigerian social media circle that uh, Mutala, you know, the boxer shot bomber, uh, didn't detonate the bomb because he loved life and Nigerians loved life. And that uh, he changed his mind and realized, I'd rather go to jail. <laughs> and so this is some kind of mythical configuration of the Nigerian person, if there's anything like that, the essential Nigerian. But all of this has changed. However, it seems to me that the fear of Boko Haram in exporting terror in those areas that I can commonly call Nigerians ungoverned spaces, because clearly if those spaces are governed, then it should be possible to bring some kind of authority, military authority to bear on them. Uh, the character of the, of, the, of the leader of Boko Haram makes it so difficult, and I think the Nigerian government is possibly trying to understand what is this all about. It says in this video that I played, you know, attack Christians. Is it killing only Christians? He is wiping entire villages. And if we understand the politics of Boko Haram in relation to the early presentations, then we do understand the complexity of what we're dealing with. Entire villages, mosques, emirs, nobody is sacrosanct in the path of this moving calamity. And so it's no longer just about establishing Western, um, or, or attacking Western interests or Western religion being evil. It is about lunacy about a character that you do not even understand what he represents. And I think this is what um, our studies should begin to focus on and to unravel. What is the mission of Boko Haram? He's destroying mosques, children. Before now, as uh, Dr. Rila had pointed, children were in the mix. Now, young girls as young as nine are being deployed as suicide bombers. And you begin to imagine the kind of scare that have occasionally popped up in Lagos, where uh, some people were suspected either at a bus terminal or that kind of thing. And so this inability to fully comprehend this character and what he represents, I believe, is at the core of what is delaying Nigerian military forces. Besides the issue of corruption, which is very real, and I think we haven't talked about that, why has this military uh, that has some of the most elite forces in the, in the continent being unable to move decisively against Boko Haram. Are there issues of sabotage, fifth columnists, and so many of these other things? But I thought that um, I'd like to stop here because uh, the issue of Boko Haram is such that uh, speakers, especially um, who are anti terror, you know, get so passionate that um, if I don't watch it, I'm just going to end up using the rest of the time. Uh, so that gives us about 15 minutes. There's one other clip I wanted to play, but I think I will just suspend that. Since looking at Shekharo, um, our last digit opportunity to begin to reflect on what mission this guy had. You can think about the leaders of Al Qaeda, you can think about so many other people, as crazy as they might be, they seem to have specific targets and interests. But this is not the case with Boko Haram. 
what does Boko Haram represent and why has um, the inability to comprehend Boko Haram's mission in addition to other factors mitigated the attack on um, the, the government uh, policies on Boko Haram. There has been um, a state of emergency, which has been renewed. Nigeria declared a state of emergency. The political structure of the country in terms of the, of, uh, the north-south divide, the Muslim um, and Christian, and then of all these um, for lovers, you know, it's February 14 that Nigeria is going to election. February 14, 2015, presidential elections. How is the fight against Boko Haram also framing the politics? Uh, these are some of the underlying uh, factors that we can't immediately um, uh, tackle. But I thought that I wanted to open up this conversation more and to draw attention to the personality that we're dealing with and what possible missions it represents to further conceptualize the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. As uh, Lucas said, we have lots of information to, uh, to present. We don't have too much time for the discussion. I hope there's not another class coming in here at two, uh, 1 o'clock. We may be able to stay longer. Um, so I open up for, for questions. Uh, please, if you don't mind, when you uh, pose a question, just let, let us know who you are. Any questions, comments? We'll take a couple at a time, and then uh, then we'll turn back to panels. And if it's directed to anyone specific, please, please mention it. Sure. I actually have a question for uh, Dr. Adesanya. Uh, he made the reflection that there is no there's lack of national uh, cohesion in some ways. Uh, uh, something in that line. Uh, why there is no uh, empathy within uh, generally across the uh, uh, Nigeria. But does in, in that critique, don't you think there's don't you think you, uh, m you don't think, th think we're missing a point here that in general empathy, the way that we understand empathy in Nigeria right now, it's not, or, or beyond Nigeria, it's not so much, um, like people don't have the same affinity that you hold in the West, which is built within a culture in itself. Like, don't you think that's what's playing within that Nigerian context beyond the way that we, that we see it as a Northwest South thing? Because the same thing could also happen within the same South, South region. If it happened on one side, we still got the same people within that South South region also, also make that sort of reflection as well. That is their problem, you know. Don't you think what is the problem is not so much the North South problem, but a cultural issue which is not embroidered the way the empathy has been embroidered in society and how you can reflect someone's uh, pain. Okay, I've got a question, in. sir. Uh, I'm Tabo Major from South Africa. I do comment from South Africa. Uh, what I'd like to ask is that uh, what will happen uh, on this uh, February forthcoming election where good luck Jonathan is busy uh, campaigning for the, this coming election? What is your uh, future for you foresee for this coming uh, election? Will they be disturbed or not? Okay, one more question, then we'll turn to the panel. It, uh, it seems that since 1960, Nigeria has been racked with various rebellions, whether it's Biafra, or Sini in the 1980s, or men, and now with Boko Haram. And I was wondering if any of you guys could further expand upon some of the underlying causes for uh, conflict in Nigeria's political world. Okay. Start with Pius? Yeah, um, I, I don't necessarily think that um, empathy, because uh, if I understand you well, you're saying that, um, it appears you're saying that there's something transcultural or transcendental about empathy in the West, uh, as opposed to it's being localized in in some ways, uh, there's something that would change a, a body of people that they feel the same connection in so on. I, I think that, I, I don't necessarily think that one culture has a 
an innate or intrinsic capacity to be more empathetic than the other. I think what's going on in our case is a, is a, an approach to account for, for the colonial origins of that is that there are discontents. There are discontents that are making fundamental ethnic and religious discontents that are making uh, the emergence of a pan-Nigerian structure of empathy uh, almost impossible. You know, because right from the, the foundation, you know, uh, that, that nation was, I don't even know why I'm calling it a nation. You know, even the founding fathers weren't so sure one said it's a mere geographical expression and all the, the meaning of it or it's still being it's, it has been contested from the get-go and one's inability to then uh, associate fundamentally with um, uh, maybe you are empathetic nationally only in football you, know, you, don't, you don't care what your religion or the, or the, or the or the ethnicity of a footballer is in Nigeria, but beyond that, then it's people withdraw into their ethnic ethnic capes largely because of those discontents that were so central to the emergence of that nation state uh, itself. And in, in a way, you could you could um, of course. Um, Colonialism is not singularly responsible for it. You know, it's other things after that foundation had built on it uh, locally to exacerbate it. But you could, in a way, also use that to account partly for for men, for Mitatsini, uh, for Biafra. Biafra grew out of that sense of of, of, of a fundamental discontent. A fundamental discontent with, 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 um, uh, with Nigerian nationhood, and it's a discontent which had consequences, genocidal consequences. People were killed uh, and all that, and it's still not been exorcised because uh, even in, 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 in the Nigerian public sphere, which is a very, very animated public sphere, it's moved largely to, to social media these days and all that. Uh, Throw up Biafra. Throw up Biafra as it would. Just throw it out there. And you'll be amazed at the at the fireworks. At the fireworks. Even just mention two million two million Ibos died. You'd think you'd think that there will be something like, oh, um, a general Empathetic, empathetic. Uh, if, if you were to bring up, if you were to bring up the Holocaust, for instance, if you were to bring up the concentration camp and the victims, there would be no basis for anybody to. It would be in horribly poor taste for anybody to start saying, "Wait, let's, um, you know, let's examine this." Did it? But bring up Biafra. Ah, yeah, you know, it was your, your, you know, and then depending on who you are, where you're coming from, and then there would be a debate. But we're talking about two million, two million lives or thereabouts. Where should there even be a debate? Because the fundamental problems of the emergence of that nationhood, as even Mamdani, Mamdani did that in relation to the, the, the Tutsi Hutu, uh, which book now they, um, when victims become killers, you know, he tries to account for that. What makes empathy impossible? It's not that those cultures are innately incapable of, of empathy, but a great deal of um, discontent has been built into that, in which case you, you politicize empathy. So it's the politics of it. I don't know if, uh, yeah, if, if I may add to that. I, I think that um, a part of it is that um, a national identity is always um, a becoming. It's never a being. It, it's, it's, it's a work that, that's always in progress. 
you've got to work on it day by day, step by step, brick by brick. That has not been happening in the Nigerian case. Um, and I'm thinking here about Benedict Anderson's emerging communities, uh, where you can have very disparate, uh, totally warring parties, and over time they begin to have this sense of unity, oneness, identity, and so forth. It has to be uh, consciously fabricated because it is, in fact, an artifice. It's, it's, it's a mythical creation. Unfortunately, that has not happened in Asia. That's not to say that it cannot happen. It can. Uh, but also because of the skewed structure of opportunities in the country, uh, you know, the center as the, the distributor of all of these resources. So there's a lot of agitation. There's, there's a lot of grievance in the system. Uh, it's so that and it's, it's, it's this uh, zero-sum game where someone wins to the extent that the other loses. And, and, and I think those, those sort of dynamics are responsible for the lack of um, the sort of empathy levels that, that ought to happen in, in tragedies such as that. Uh, and if we can move on to the question of, of the election, uh, where we're all sort of, or at least I am fairly far removed from the ground um, in, in Nigeria and in the, the politicking that's going on. Um, but I think the scientific answer to your question, uh, the South African brother, is that I don't know. <laughs> I do not. Um, we would hope that there, there will be peace afterwards, that the winner, whoever that is, accepts uh, and, and is gracious in victory, and that the, the loser, or whoever that is, is, is also uh, kind in their approach um, to the victor of that election, whoever that is. Um, it, I think the, the, the fact that the two uh, leading contestants signed a peace accord uh, bodes well in that regard. Um, let, let's hope that they, they maintain that momentum and that um, in terms of rallying the troops after the results are announced that uh, that uh, reason will prevail for the sake of the country. But the reality is nobody's sure about what, what will happen. Okay, if I could just say um, I'm joined to that. Um, two ways of looking at this is to also begin with a question. If there were a natural resource in the southeastern part of Nigeria, how would the Boko Haram insurgency be handled? In the northeastern part. In the north, the sorry, northeast. in the northeastern yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. I keep talking about south. Yeah, in the northeastern part of the country, how would the Boko Haram insurgency be handled? I think it would have been a different story. There's a certain kind of hesitation about crushing Boko Haram, and it's not for nothing. Um, in response to the February election that it is actually not a campaign issue. It is, it, is, it is scandalized together. The gladiators in the Nigerian political terrain are not engaging in any issue-oriented campaign. It's about some members of the PDP who were disenfranchised, it also to speak from the party, who move on to the, the opposition party. And so you do not have, from a Western point of view, clear ideological party structure that this is what that Dr. Adesami has liberal leanings and um, uh, Dr. Oriola has conservative leaning. And so these are not campaigns run on principle. What does that mean for 2000, uh, 2015, February 14 election? It means that in my own prognosis that the all-powerful center is going to exact, and, and I mean whoever wins, I'm not predicting the results, is going to exert the full force, what we call in Nigeria, the federal might, which includes the dispenser of gifts and a whole lot of other people fall in line. And so um, there is a trope in the onshore and offshore social media in Nigeria, offshore as in um, diaspora Nigerians, uh, where you're talking with some of your colleagues who live in the continent and who will say, you, you diaspora people, Una to they get exaggerated idea of what thing they happen. You know, when I just didn't say Nigeria go born, we'll not be here where they live. <laughs> Nothing will happen. In other words, you have people who have a very stoic spirit that believe that nothing is gonna to happen to Nigeria. It's like a country that is always in a precipice. And I have uh, my friends in the media 
you know, um, having been a journalist for several years, who said, look, we've been covering this country. Nothing is going to happen. We have fought the last war. No Nigerian wants to go to war. You will hear a whole lot of this in the popular discourses. How uh, this ties into the fight against Boko Haram, you know, it's so important. But I think that on February 15th, there's going to be an election. There might be skirmishes here and there. And then I think at the end of the day, some members of the opposition party or the ruling party, depending on who wins, might cross carpet to do deals. And this happens, you know, they will, they will, as soon as it happened under the military. When General Abacha was, um, you know, when the, um, the wider international community in the United States supported General Abacha for, for to, that he could run an election as long as he stopped being a military dictator. And many other politicians, you know, began to juggle for positions in his party. And some of those who were singing on June 12 we stand, which was the, the freest and fairest election, defected overnight and deals were broken in the night. So there is, you know, this issue of the rentier state and its role in beating so many people into wine. However, I just, um, as a way of living it, you know, in terms of a crisis, yes, you're right. You know, these conflicts still come. And the worst has been the genocide against the evils. Two million people and, you know, the country is still going. So the attitude, I believe, that makes Boko Haram continue to thrive is a, just leave this guy. It's, it's a local problem. And it seems to me that the complexion of the fight against Boko Haram will change when the state determines, and the state, you know, I'm using the very complex Nigeria as a corporate entity, no matter whether it's south or west or east and north, you know, when the state realizes that there is a potent threat you know, of existence. So for now, there is not even an issue on the campaign. And then you're looking at the Baga massacre, 200 people. There are almost, you know, close to 4,000 people who have been killed by Boko Haram. And much of this has been in the last two, in the last three years, 2009, or about six years. And then the frequency is increasing. So uh, there are a whole lot of underlying politics and the question of, of capital um, access, you know, resource access and also um, influencing the general flow of uh, Nigerian political economy. Yeah, and just to you know, tie to uh, what uh, Dr. Tiona has just said, um, a former president of Nigeria, Obusha Gombasujo, uh, recently um, uh, contemplated publishing his memoirs, and um, uh, in some of the reports published online, um, he narrated his encounter with the current president uh, about Boko Haram and what the government was doing, and that the president basically said, Oh, Boko Haram is just his enemies killing one another. <laughs> that is the current president saying that. So I, I, that's his mentality. That's the way he views the problem. It's not an oligarchy fighting themselves. It is your problem. Uh, and so, so I think that, you know, that again shows you um, the, the, the viewpoint of those to whom uh, the destiny of the country is entrusted. And, and that explains, I guess, in part what we now witness. But just to answer the, uh, the other question, which is about the, the causes of conflict, and, and yes, uh, conflict management has become an intrinsic aspect of governance in Nigeria. So there's always this shift from one conflict to another. Umuleri, Aguleri, Ifemodakeke, the Wari, Trapatek, the Bako, Shakiri, Robo, Ijaz, and, and so forth. So it's always been one chaos after the other. But uh, I quickly noted a few things here. Um, Intra-elite squabbles has always featured prominently in each of those conflicts, be that at the presidential level or the local level, the traditional rulers and so forth. Years of military dictatorship have obviously not helped uh, because they have uh, uh, brought into place a certain way of doing things, uh, which does not all go well you know, for democratic governance and so forth. I often tell my, my students uh, um, that well, I grew up uh, under the military in Nigeria, so I'm not very democratic. So be careful what you wish for in my class. Yeah. Um, so that, 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 comes, that comes with a certain mindset, a certain attitude, and so forth. Um, but and, and as I alluded to earlier, the structure of opportunity in the system is skewed. Um, and you, you find uh, a, a, a dangerously poor Talakawa in northern Nigeria. Right for, uh, for the manipulation of groups such as Boko Haram, uh, or uh, um, 
able and willing, or perhaps unable to be unwilling to be tools in the hands of, of groups such as Boko Haram. Uh, and ethnicity is obviously a very big issue. Again, as I said earlier, we have not managed to forge or fabricate a concise national identity. Uh, and finally, socioeconomic problems, unemployment, uh, uh, cost of housing and all of that, making daily living difficult for the average person, particularly in northern Nigeria, where uh, even in, in, in a, a relatively poor country, you have the levels of poverty that have been so staggering that other countries appear, re or rather other states appear much richer. And so just to put it into perspective, the 10 poorest states in Nigeria are in northern Nigeria. The 10 richest states are in southern Nigeria. And I think that season already says it all uh, in terms of how uh, and, and why things like this develop. And I'm going to leave with that. Now, officially we're over. However, uh, we are being kicked out of the classroom. So uh, I, if everyone's in agreement, we can continue. But of course, if you have to leave, you know, feel free to, to make yourself a leave. You're okay, you're, you three are okay to continue the conversation. So we'll let people slip out. And then if you have further questions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you have other questions, uh, please put up your hand. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll wait for Mary for these Okay. I'm still going to discuss it. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so we, okay, okay, if I can get. Uh, All right, so the, the, the discussion is still going on. We have a question here, we have a question here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor, this one. Uh, I'm also a social media person. And, uh, yeah. Given what I've been re reading in recent times as regards the election, the overwhelming support Buhari is getting from the South, yeah. if that reflects the reality on ground, how do we explain this phenomenon? Mm. Okay, is there other, other questions? Okay, so yeah. Um, for many North Americans, uh, the abduction of the schoolgirls uh, was, I think, their first awareness of this ongoing problem with uh, Boko Haram. So you have American celebrities now suddenly tweeting about this issue. Uh, and I think a lot of those responses uh, were really m motivated by the fact that these were children and, and girls. Uh, and I was just wondering how this kind of rupture, or it's not really a rupture, but how this, this, um, this moment of recognition maps on or doesn't to, uh, as Nduka described, the offshore and onshore perspectives. Is it more of a continuum? Is there uh, a certain virulence to the response? Does it seem to have shifted people's understandings? The fact that uh, children are being increasingly involved in, and again, was this more of a, a rupture or a continuity in terms of people's responses? Yes, I'm Louise Wimea. I'm the chair of the Africa Study Group. Um, I have a, a broader question. I was struck by Pius' uh, analysis of the francophone anglophone divide. Now, the African Union has, at least on paper, a very ambitious plan for 2063, which calls on African unity and very bold, uh, very bold uh, and ambitious goals. And uh, so that would mean, you know, I mean, people, countries working together and so on, and regions, sub, and sub-regions as well. So what's your perspective on that, you know, with this African... <laughs> 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 on the chance yeah, so, of so, 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 well, well, If you don't, can we take a couple more questions and then... Oh, sure, why not? Yeah, then we'll have I'm Kimberly, I come from the Canadian Council for International Cooperation. It's absolutely horrific, that region. Sorry, I'm just based on our... My question is just about NGOs. So what kind of civil society organizations are organizing in Nigeria around this issue? What are they asking? What are they saying? And, and what can the Canadian government do uh, to work on security issues? And if the panel doesn't mind, we'll just take a bunch of questions and that'll be the last round since I know everyone's got the same idea. Like, there, there. 
Yeah, I'm just um, reflecting on the, you know, recent years, the conflicts in Central Africa and the, um, you know, government's inability to cope with militias. Congo comes to mind especially. But it didn't catch fire in the attention of the West. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on fundamental differences with Boko Haram or why all of a sudden now we're paying attention. Okay. Um, my name is Brad. I'm a student in political science. Um, my question is for all three of you generally, but mainly you, Dr. Orelu, because uh, one of your graphs in your presentation piqued my interest. So. Uh, typically, when a terrorist organization is going about its business, it wants to um, claim responsibility for its attack so that it can, it can, uh, you know, gain its credibility vis-a-vis -vis the government and say, in, in the case of Boko Haram, for instance, uh, the government can't stop us. They're, you know, the political will is not there. They're not capable. We're winning. Okay, but uh, in some of your graphs, you showed that the the share of terrorist attacks in Nigeria. Um, Boko Haram is increasing their share as number of the proportion of the total attacks, whereas their their share of the attribution of their attacks is decreasing. I think in a different chart, and so that makes me wonder why would not would they not want um, to claim responsibility for those attacks given a uh, terrorist organization going on? Hi, yeah, I'm uh, David Moore from the University of Johannesburg. Um, 